الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد مفتاح باب رحمه الله عدد ما في علم الله صراط وسلام دائما بدمك الله وعلى اله وصحبه ومن والاه وشر ان الله الذي لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له وشر ان سيدنا محمد عبده ورسوله ارسل الله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهر على الدين كله ولو كره المشركون اما بعد الحمد لله it's in gatherings like this that we remind ourselves of the blessing of islam alhamdulillah alladhi hadana li hadha wa ma kunna li lahtadi an la an hadana allah that we give thanks in gratitude to our lord subhanahu wa ta'ala who guided us to this and this is one of the gardens of the gardens of paradise bin nasr habib sallallahu alayhi wasallam as he explicitly said and he invited us sallallahu alayhi wasallam and commanded us and encouraged us farta'u to graze therein, graze and swim in the meanings of the remembrance of Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and be around people that are going to inspire us and why we collectively come together with a common wujha and direction of our heart towards our Lord Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is that it is a means for what is known as istimtar rahmatillah to be a means for the outpour of the divine mercy to descend upon the gathering and then once mercy descends that there's nothing else that you can articulate on the tongue at that point and it's these types of gatherings that we remind ourselves of the blessing of hidayah that very recently that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed me to have my 19th birthday in Islam and now I've been Muslim longer than I have that not a Muslim and even though that someone when they enter into this blessed faith is that they feel like it's already been a part of them in reality that we're coming back to our nature that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created upon because this is the deen of fitrah this is the religion of the natural innate disposition of the human being and alhamdulillah that I can't help to see that friends and loved ones before us and to also remind them that I remember speaking that many many times of our dear friend Uncle Simon about that hopefully the day that I would also see my father do what he did and see my mother do what his wife has done and alhamdulillah that several months ago my blessed mother that she entered into this faith and said the realities of la ilaha illa muhammad rasulullah and said the shahada and this is something that comes when you sit with the people of Allah and when you sit with the people of ma'rifa even though what we are entirely undeserving of it and do everything to distance ourselves from it but this is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that when you're with them that their barakah is mutaaddiya that it extends beyond you and to your family and to your neighbors and those that are around you and extends beyond to you that those in your region this is something that Allah Ta'ala blessed Sheikh Abdul Karim's mother with as well and many other people that we know from the blessing of connecting to the people of Allah and there's nothing better in life than to connect to the people of Allah and the inheritors of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam hunak al aish wa bahjatu this is all of life and that we hope and that we imagine that if we is as beauty as it is 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 as beautiful as it is to sit before the inheritors of Rasulullah and everything that you experience from the paradisical states of the akhirah about fourth in this dunya that murafaqat musahabat rijal dawil wafai naim al khuldi fi dar al fanai as one of them said is that spending time with the men of god is that there's the people of fulfillment it, it is a paradisical eternal pleasure brought forth in this world and that when you go through that and you enter into the wake of that and by the bubble over effect into your heart from their heart and this transmission takes place as that alhamdulillah that it's a means to plant seeds in your heart and it's a means then as a result of those seeds for the blessed and the blessed things to grow in your heart and that the meanings of faith to blossom and everything that comes from that from the realities of this deen so alhamdulillah that we should give thanks to our lord subhanahu wa ta'ala and that we should always recognize as that our iman and our faith itself has a connection to rasulullah is that the connection of faith to the messenger of allah is also one of love and as as Sheikh Yusuf and Nabahani pointed out is that we have love and we have iman but there is a correlation between the two the more that our iman strengthens the more that our love of our prophet strengthens the more that the love of our prophet strengthens the more that our iman strengthens and this is the relationship and this will remain the relationship not for only for the people who came before us but the people that are going to come until the end of time until the last subhanahu ta'ala decrees that the last believer is taken from this earth this is what this affair is all about is that the transient world that we're living in there's a limited number of days every single one of us will take a limited number of breaths this is why wal al akhirul khairu laka min al ula and that the next moment the next world yes but also the next moment is better for you than this 
that we have to recognize is that the next world is it is everlasting and it is going to go on. And the only meaning of ever, the everlasting nature of the next world that is worthy for us to prepare for this, in this world is the meaning of love because all of the bliss of paradise will stem to according to the, from our degree of love and following our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam and says why that we come together in the month of Rabi'u al-Awwal and outside the month of Rabi'u al-Awwal but especially in the month of Rabi'u al-Awwal to remind ourselves of the blessing of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who said inna ma'ana rahmatun muhda who was a gift of mercy sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to this creation Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gifted us the Prophet were it not to be for the Prophet you and I would not be standing here so we thank our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala for that and we also come together, together to recognize is that the way of our Prophet is the way for us to be able to attain the divine contentment that he left us upon a way that if we follow it and we adhere to it is that we will never go astray after him وسلم, and this is the way of the Quran and the way of his sunnah especially the way as we heard in these blessed verses that were recited earlier the way that the family his family وسلم, understood his sunnah there will be هَذَا الْحُبِّ لَا نَخْشَ الْمِحَنْ Loving the people of Allah, loving the Arifin, loving the Ahl Bayt Rasulullah. If the reality comes into your heart, this is the greatest meaning of what it means to ride the metaphorical ark of Noah's ark in relation to our, our connection to Ahl Bayt. The greatest meaning of that is our love that we show from them. That love in and of itself. Even if it's not followed up with anything else, and ideally it would be, but even if it's not, is that it will lead to a protection is it will lead to a barrier between you and that which is displeasing to Allah. It will be a means that even if you are hit with the tribulation, that there will be a shield and there will be a fortress on your heart, is that the impact will be limited and Allah Ta'ala will give you tawfiq and enabling grace to be able to deal with it in a way that is pleasing to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we have to remember that our Prophet was sent for us. Allah mentions in the Quran, subhanahu wa ta'ala, kama arsana fikum, rasulan minkum. And thus that we have sent amongst you a messenger from you. Yatlu alaykum ayatina wa yuzakikum. Is that he recites to you our signs, our verses, and he purifies you. Wa yu'allimukum al-kitabu al-hikmata. And he teaches you the book and the wisdom. Wa yu'allimukum ma'alam takunu ta'alamum. And he also teaches you that which you never ever knew is that Allah Ta'ala first gave knowledge to our Prophet Sallallahu and by extension that knowledge came to us. All of the things that we did not know, if you think about the experiential joy of coming to know, has come to us by means of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But our Lord tells us about our Prophet, that he recites to us the book. And this is why is that the oral transmission of the book of Allah precedes the written transmission. Is that you can imagine what the state would have been like of the companions hearing the blessed recitation of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we know that there are great imams because of their close connection with Rasulullah is that they had a recitation that resembled the recitation of Rasulullah. And such that you find some of the great imams, the likes of Habib Ali bin Muhammad al-Habshi, when he would pray behind the great imam Ahmed bin Hassan al-Attas, who dies one year after him in 1334 and Habib Ali al-Habshi dies in 1333 as it even though in the Shafi school of thought that whenever you pray behind an imam as a follower that you're required to recite the Fatiha to kitab they understood the words of a messenger of Allah literally is that la salat liman la yaqra al Fatiha to kitab is that one's prayer is not accepted unless they recite the Fatiha of the book but despite that because of the way that the recitation of Habib Ahmed and Hassan al-Tas resembled the recitation of al Habib al-Adham sallallahu alaihi wasallam is that he didn't want to mention he didn't want to miss even one letter of its recitation that he would not recite and he would follow a different opinion of a different school in order that he would not miss one letter of recitation from the blessed Habib Ahmed Hassan al-Tas. These are people that are connected to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You can imagine what would have been the state of the Sahaba because our Prophet was described as having a qira'a mufassira. Is that the way that he used to recite the Quran Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that the meanings would be unveiled to the Sahaba in their hearts just by virtue of the way that the Prophet recited Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They would come to know the meanings and not only only in terms of a knowledge of those meanings is but the Quran would affect him at the deepest level of their being. And this is the difference between taking knowledge from a computer and taking a knowledge from the heart of the best of creation that Allah says about Were we to have revealed this Quran upon a mountain that you would have seen it fearful and split asunder from the reverential awe of God. But it came down to the heart of our Prophet 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assisted him to be able to bear this revelation and then to be able to transmit that revelation to the Sahaba. And they were able to transmit that revelation to the Tabi'een. And an unbroken chain of narration to this very day and age that we still have living representatives of this tradition whose hearts are alive with the meanings of remembrance of Allah, that are alive with the meanings of following the, the Sunnah of the Prophet and living his inheritance that he left behind, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He used to recite the Quran to the Sahaba. And it used to deeply impact the Sahaba. And this is what enabled them to do what it is that they were able to do. But the other thing here is not only a recitation of her, what you zakihim, that he also used to purify them. And that we understand is that our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is that he used to give tarbiyah to the Sahaba. And the very nature of tarbiyah, it's taking something in its rudimentary form and it's taking it to its very end. It's taking it from the seed and to its fruition when it actually bears fruit. And this is what our Prophet did sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is that he found the companions in the state that they were in and he met them where they were and he would go out to them sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that he would embrace them and he would bring them in and they would come to love him and he would teach them their deen and they would implement it and some of them would make mistakes and he would be patient with them and he would direct them toward what is good until that that very last one of his very last days is as Imam Abu Bakr as Siddiq is leading the prayer and then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is ill and in his home and he pulls back the curtain because he didn't even have a door he lived according to the bare minimum is that you could touch the roof of his house Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and when Sayyidah Aisha used to pray is she used to have to tap the leg of the Prophet in order to move bare minimum. He only wanted to take from this dunya what was absolutely necessary. He didn't even have a door. But also, what does that say to you when he doesn't even have a door? I am here for you. I am here for you, and I will be there for you. Hayati khayrun lakum, mamati khayrun lakum. Whether I'm alive or whether I'm returned to Allah Ta'ala, it is good for you in both different states. A'mali tu'rad, a'malukum tu'rad alayya. Even our actions are shown to him, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam. And if he finds good, he thanks Allah. And if he finds other than that, he didn't even want to call it a ma'asiyah, an act of disobedience that he seeks forgiveness for us, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. What a beautiful prophet. Hadithun alaykum bin mu'minin ar-ru'ufur rahim. He is concerned for us and that he is compassionate and merciful towards the believers Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam But as that he pulled back the curtain that he took him from that initial state five or six years into the seerah And there's still only about 30 to 35 believers in Mecca and Muqarramah until that you have over 100,000 plus believers by the time that he returns to his Lord So when he pulls back that curtain that he smiles and in the hadith in Bukhari is that the Sahaba mentioned and otherwise How would they have known this had happened if they didn't look they're in prayer turning towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but they said that they noticed that the Prophet them smiled as that he smiled and what was behind that smile nafsi fida may our soul be ransomed ya Rasulullah this is a smile of the contentment of the best of creation of those that he trained sallallahu alayhi wasallam is that he gave tarbiyah to is that he took them from their inhumane barbaric state which was the state of the vast majority of them to a state where they were pleasing to Allah where they were going to die and attain the contentment of Allah, where they were now ready then to take this message and pass it on to the generations that come after them. What you zakihim is that he, tra he trained them, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there is a hadith narrated by Imam al-Tabarani and also narrated in the collection of Imam ibn al-Sakr, which tells us and exemplifies for us one of these beautiful instances of the way that our Prophet used to engage his people and engage the companions that were chosen to be there with them. And in the story that we find is that it's narrated by one of the Sahaba by the name of Khawat, Khawat ibn Jubair. And that he said that as a narrator of the hadith, he says, is that in the time of Jahaliyyah, in the pre-Islamic period, that I used to be a poet. And he says that I used to, that at the ghazal, that I used to write erotic love poetry that where I had oftentimes that mention women in these poetry. And wa usamiru hun. And I used to spend a lot of time at night with them. He says, then Allah Ta'ala blessed me with Islam. And as Allah blessed me with Islam, one time that I traveled with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And when they went out to travel, that I pitched a tent. And one night that I come out of my tent, and there's a group of women that are sitting near my tent. And he says, I was impressed by these women that were sitting near my tent. He says, so I went back into my tent, and I found the best garment that I had, and I wore it. And I walk out of my tent, and I go to sit with them. And I started talking to them. And he says, then all of a sudden, the Prophet Sallallahu and walks by. And he says, oh, father of Abdullah, why are you sitting with these women? 
And he says that when this happened, La ilaha illallah, he says that I was in awe of the Prophet Sallallahu and I couldn't even speak properly because I was so embarrassed. He said, Ya Rasulullah, that I've lost a camel and I'm asking them if they know where my camel is. <laughs> but look at what the hadith says. Fabtasim. The Prophet smiled. The Prophet smiled, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. You don't think the Prophet knew what the man was doing? You don't think the Prophet knew that the man was doing something that he shouldn't have been doing? But the Prophet smiled, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. He says, and then the Prophet sallallahu left, and then Khawat says about his own self. He says that I was so embarrassed. Is that there, what could I do that I was trying to avoid the Prophet sallallahu for the rest of the trip. He says, so then that we, that he says that the Prophet, every time that he saw me on this trip, as he did ask me, Ma fa'ala shiradu ba'irak, ya Abu Abdullah. What happened to your camel that strayed away, O father of Abdullah? And he says that he kept responding and kept responding until they returned to Medina. And it reached the point the Prophet asked him so many times, he said, I started to avoid him. And he says, I would look for times to enter into the mosque of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he wasn't there. And one time I was passing by and didn't see the Prophet in the mosque, so I went in. And when I went in, I entered into my prayer. He says, and when I said, Allahu Akbar, and I started my prayer, I saw from the corner of my eye that the Prophet came into the mosque. And then he came near me, and he prayed two light rak'ahs. And after he sent his salams from his prayer, that he sat right next to me. And this whole time that he said to me, he said that I, at that point, when I saw the Prophet sitting there, I said to myself, La'utilanna salah. I'm going to pray for a long time until he goes. <laughs> and when the Prophet realized that I was going to pray for a long time, he spoke to me in, while I was in my prayer. And he says, prolong your prayer as long as you wish. I'm sitting here waiting for you. So he's praying, and then he's waiting and waiting and waiting. He sends his salams, and then he turns to the Prophet Sallallahu and the Prophet was smiling. He says, what happened to your camel, Khawat? He says, what happened to your camel? And he says, at that point, there was nowhere else for me to turn. And then he says, and look at what happens at this point. He says, By the one who sent you with truth, he says, my camel never ever that went astray from the time that I become Muslim, that this was simultaneously what he was saying, is that he never ever lost his camel, his camel didn't go astray and that sin that he committed, this was the first time that he'd done this in the time that he'd become Muslim, and then the Prophet smiled at him and said, Rahimak Allah Rahimak Allah, Rahimak Allah May Allah have mercy on you May Allah have mercy on you, May Allah have mercy on you, then it said in the hadith Falam yu'ud, he never ever returned to what he did this is the way our Prophet was, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Compare this to the way that many people interact with people that are not doing what the things he know that they're not supposed to be doing. But our Prophet understood the way that people were. He understood that people have backgrounds. He understood that they have idiosyncrasies. He understood that just as it's difficult for you to leave those things that are difficult for you to leave, it's also difficult for other people to leave the things that are difficult for them to leave. And this is what our Prophet was sent for. He was sent to uplift. He was sent to heal. He was sent to be able to extend the mercy and light of our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala so that it could touch your heart so that you could better yourself and you could prepare yourself to meet in a good state. This is the teaching of our Prophet sallallahu and this is what he brought and this was a part of the what he did with all of the companions of, 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 of all of his companions is that he was a means for them to become refined and to transform into people that were beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so wa yuzakkihim wa yu'allimuhum al-kitab wa al-hikmah but he taught them the book and he also taught them the wisdom and generally speaking when you recite this verse and you see what the, the exegetes say about it is that they will say that the hikmah is the sunnah of our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam but what we understand by that is, is that not only do we have the book, but we have the living example of that book. We know the application of that book. We have an encouragement through the sunnah of our Prophet ﷺ to be able to act with the book. But this is a time in which we live, in the age of information, in an explosion of knowledge. That knowledge is literally quite exploding, that we have more access to knowledge now than we ever have outwardly in human history. But oh, how we are lacking wisdom. We are lacking, lacking, lacking wisdom. And if you look at some of the early people, how they define wisdom is that it tells us a little bit of a difference between knowledge and between wisdom. Fadil ibn Iyad said the following. He says, Al-ulama, that the scholars, that there's many scholars, and he's referring to his time. Al-ulama kathir wal-hukama qalil. 
There are many scholars, but there few are actually very wise. And in our time that you could say, there are very few scholars and there's even less wise people. And then he says, is that that hukamat, they are the real warathat al-anbiya. The wise scholars are the real inheritors of our Prophet Sallallahu But then he's going to go on to define what the difference is between a Hakim who also has knowledge and someone that merely has knowledge. And he says, what is wisdom? He says, fil hikmatu hi al-ilm al-nafi'. Wisdom is beneficial knowledge yet ba'hu amal that leads to doing pious good deeds for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and its reality is nurun yaqdif Allahu fil qalb is a light that Allah ta'ala places in our heart and that through this light yafhamu biha ma'na al-ilm al-munzal min as-sama' that you understand the meaning of revealed knowledge that comes from heaven and then this knowledge leads to its implementation and it leads to its dissemination amongst creation. This is the reality of wisdom. Is that wisdom is not just about having information. It's about knowing what is the right thing to do in any given moment. And if you were to look at all of the outward characteristics for you to be able to determine in any situation what was the right thing to do. As long as you are trapped in the plenary realm and you don't have a connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the chains of transmission back to the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you will be limited. No matter how much it is studied, no matter how much money is spent, you will be limited until that you are connected through a source will open up another dimension for you to understand what truly is the best thing for you to do in your moment. This only comes from religious teachings. This only comes from the light that comes from this transmission and that when this is present is that you will be open to an understanding and a knowledge that is inaccessible to anyone else and this is why our prophet lived in the time that he did in the geographical place that he did but left teachings in 23 years that will be guidance for humanity until Yom Qiyama putting everything in its proper place because our prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is that he بَلَّغَ رسالة. He conveyed the message and that he properly وسلم, that took care of this trust that was on his shoulders and he advised us well وسلم, and what remains in is for you and I is to take our portion of this prophetic inheritance and open our hearts to it so that we can then dedicate ourselves to our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala and that we can be able to receive those fruits and to be walking here on planet earth but to have our hearts attached to the celestial and this is the essential description of the ulama al-amilin as Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib who was the Bab Medina al-ilm said to Kumail when he was asked he says hum al-qawm hajma bihi al-ilm ala haqiqat al-amr they are a people that knowledge rushed them to the reality of the affair فَبَاشُرُوا رُوحُ الْيَقِينَ And so that they experience the spirit of certainty as that صَحِبَ الدُّنْيَا بِأَبْدَانِهِمْ That they were outwardly existent in the world but their physical bodies وَقُلُوبٌ مُعَلَّقُتُوا بِالْمَلَى الْأَعْلَى But their hearts were attached to the celestial realm. These are the type of people that are produced by the madrasa of Sayyidina Muhammad. May Allah Ta'ala give us tawfiq and open up our doors of all good to us. وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم والحمد لله رب العالمين